at the bar, uh, VP for research collaborations at Elsevier. So over to you, Anita. Thank you so much, Iracha. And that was Iracha Puebla, Associate Director of ASAP Bio. Um, we are really thrilled with this session and we thank you all so much for joining. Thank you very much to our speakers. Um, our first speaker will not be with us in person because the time is impossible where he's based. Uh, the Sapta Erwin Irwan has a, uh, a video message for all of us, but I think it's quite exciting. Um, but next to that, we have three speakers, Abby Stevens, who's an astronomy instructor at Michigan State University, John Bohannon, who's director of science at Prime, but also invented the Dancer PhD program, and Bomini, uh, head of research analytics for North America for Elsevier. Um, and I think there are four incredible people who have done a lot um, in terms of communicating science through different media. Um, so I was actually part of the original Force 11 group, um, and one thing I'm terribly excited at, about is that we've come full circle, and um, the SUPTA completely spontaneously made this gorgeous uh, little doodle of May the Force 11 be with you, and when we started originally, the name was FORC, Future of Research Communications, um, and I was thinking of all kinds of weak jokes like use the fork Luke or the fork is strong in this one. Um, but um, I think it, it's it's honestly true that that in the 10 years since Force 11 started, we've seen an absolute explosion um, in terms of topics that have uh, been connected to, to research communications. Um, we've seen some amazing panel sessions and keynotes um, in these past few days that really talk about open science, um, enhancing diversity, and a great representation of panels, panel members, and speakers from around the world. Um, so I, what when we started Force 11, one of the things that we were thinking was all of our communications have changed so unbelievably radically in the past 30 years. Um, but science communication at that point was still mostly through PDFs. And in fact, there was a meeting that we connected to that was called Beyond the PDF. And of course, it's it's rather ironic that a lot of the material that is being linked to in chats even today during the meetings uh, points to PDFs. But I think these people are really changing the game um, and helping explore what does it look like to communicate science in different means. Um, so without further ado, what I'd like to do is first of all, hand off to our three panelists. Um, uh, sorry, first we'll watch the video. After that, we will um, ask our three panelists to introduce themselves and say a bit about their work. So without further ado, handing over to you, um, Iraj, to play the video. Um, let us, yeah, that should work. Thank you. Oh, um, okay, speaking of new formats, let's attempt this. Um, hopefully you can see now. That's not what you should see. One second. Okay. Um, having me uh, in this exciting event. So yes, um, my name is Dasapta. I am a researcher in hydrogeology. I am a researcher of hydrogeology. I study groundwater and its behavior in nature. I am working as a lecturer in Institute Technology Bandung, the first engineering university in Indonesia. It was in 2013 when I stumbled upon a blog called Fossil Sunshit, uh, written by John Tennant. He was responsible for taking me uh, into this open science journey. And then long story short, um, I found myself with uh, my colleagues uh, initiating uh, in-archive preprint server. Thank you, Brian Nosek from COS for supporting us back in 2017. Then in 2020, uh, with some colleagues in Indonesia, I started uh, another preprint server called Print Archive, uh, hosted by Indonesian Science Institute. It's a government institute. Uh, now changed its name to Print. And then here I am talking to you and the uh, uh, community in the, this fourth event. 
Oh, okay, about this doodling, I started off um, as an experiment when I saw my fellow researchers all have been too occupied right, with publishing in top journals, uh, seem to be forgetting their, forgetting their uh, role, their function in society. Right? That brings us into this current situation where open access only means uh, publishing your work in APC-based journals. And then to my mind, um, open access means also opening access to the content of the work, right? You need to try to explain as clear and as simple as possible to the common public so they can understand what you are working on, what are your results. In my case, I choose doodling, or some people call it uh, sketchnoting. Actually, I didn't know if I can draw and to put some meaning right into the drawing itself. So I did taught myself to do that by watching YouTube videos. Uh, I watch affordable uh, to visual channels. So I recommend also watch that channels. Uh, um, it teaches you how to uh, create sketch noting uh, from the very basics. Means that it's not the drawing. Uh, that counts, right? It was the, the message that you try to deliver. So you need to create a simple uh, analogy uh, that you can draw and try to connect the dots, right? Uh, to to convey the message, to transmit the message and the, and the process itself. It started off with a simple stationery like pens and papers start by beginning by uh, drawing simple basic shapes and arrows <laughs> my first sketch notes were basically boxes right, with text in it um, but if you do it frequently you're kind of ex exercising your creativity uh, i use mainly social media to share my drawings like facebook uh, and twitter um, but in Indonesia, uh, WhatsApp and Telegram uh, are also famous, so I use both too to, to send drawing. And then to make uh, my sketch notes citable, I also put them to Wikimedia Commons under uh, CC0 license, so people can freely use uh, use my drawings for uh, any uh, relevant purpose. So kind of uh, make people easy right, to use my work right, without uh, worrying about the license and the copyright. Yeah, thank you, uh, Iratse. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, all the people in this event. I hope you are uh, the best. So keep on the open science rolling. <laughs> See you uh, in the uh, next event or another uh, meeting. Thank you all. Great. So um, a great intro, I think. Um, so uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Abby Stevens. Um, Abby is astronomy instructor at the uh, at Michigan State University um, and, and also has some fantastic experiences. So Abby, if you could possibly introduce yourself and say something about your own experience using new media for communicating science. Yeah, um, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, so um, as an astronomer, I research black holes and neutron stars in our galaxy. These are dead stars that are like zombie stars and they tend to eat their star friend and they shine really bright X-ray light and I look at those X-rays. Um, so, but aside from this research, I'm also an instructor um, in um, the Integrative Studies for General Science at MSU. So my students are non-scientists. Um, I have about 150 of them in a virtual class. Um, and I use, um, I use social media as a way of both talking about my own research, um, as a way of connecting with my students a little bit more outside of the classroom. Um, especially for virtual class, and also as a way to connect with other academics, because um, there's a lot of academics and we have a lot to share with each other. Um, so, um, 
Oh, I also wanted to mention my background. Um, I am, um, I have a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in astronomy and astrophysics, um, a master's from the University of uh, Alberta in Canada about um, uh, physics and astrophysics. And then my bachelor's is from Bard College, which is a small private liberal arts college where I did physics and math. And I'm actually going back to Bard College as a science literacy faculty member um, for a January workshop. So anyways, social media. Um, I primarily use Twitter and I've tried out TikTok and I have a little bit of YouTube. Um, so for Twitter, I really like to connect with other academics and like nerds, which I say in a very endearing way, um, as I am also one. Um, so these are people that have some passing familiarity with astronomy and astrophysics um, and or like the academic career structure and the academic life experiences, um, just because you have such a limited character amount and the attention span is so short that there isn't as much room I find for like a ton of background information. And you can do Twitter threads, but like the, the like count drops off pretty significantly the longer the thread gets. Um, so I try to use those sparingly. Um, so I've used, I, one of the things that Twitter has been surprisingly successful for, for me is um, in creating new professional connections and collaborations. I've actually gotten like seminar invitations from meeting people on Twitter. Um, I have not yet had a paper come out of a Twitter contact, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. I know some colleagues who cited Twitter in the acknowledgements of their paper um, for like being the, the mechanism that created the collaboration. Um, so I, um, I also love when people are live tweeting conferences, which I know is happening a little bit here. Um, I find it really helpful, um, to connect with other like professional astronomers and astrophysicists. Um, like if I couldn't attend a conference, um, before they, we were doing all the virtual stuff, it was really nice to kind of see a quick snapshot of what people were doing. And I would often live tweet conferences. Um, it was really fun. It helped me kind of distill the ideas down into, you know, 240 or 280 characters, which is nice. Um, I've also used Mastodon a little bit, which is similar to Twitter. Um, I forget about it every so often, but I do have some stuff on there as well. Um, for TikTok, I wanted to try it out because it's new and everybody keeps talking about it. And I'm in my 30s now, which I've realized makes me old compared to some people, but not old compared to others. So I'm in this weird middle zone where I know about social media, but I don't know all the hottest, latest stuff. Um, but I was hesitant to try it out because of privacy concerns, honestly. I did finally join by the end of the summer, um, once I think those were ironed out. Um, I really like the creator interface. Um, it's really easy to make short little um, videos um, and like edit them together quite nicely. But um, I, have, I don't use it too much just because I feel like I haven't found a niche yet. Um, I haven't found my target audience. Whereas on Twitter, I, found, I feel like I found my target audience, like nerds who like astronomy, and other academics. Um, and I haven't quite found that niche on TikTok yet. Um, I also, I don't love their algorithm. I feel like I can feel it controlling my behavior and telling me when to post and what to post. And I rebel very strongly against that. Um, so uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm not using it as much right now, but maybe I'll get there. Um, I also use YouTube a little bit. Those are mostly videos for my students. Um, we have a separate platform through MSU that like mini lecture videos are created by myself and other professors for the class for like a flipped classroom style. Um, but I make additional videos for my students and put them on YouTube. Um, that one's great because you've got more time and space for explaining things. There's more background um, and you can have like images and text and stuff. So you can have multiple ways to communicate the same information, which is helpful. Um, I do also use Instagram and WhatsApp, but those are personal for me. Um, I, I need to, somebody said you need to watch more TikToks to get to nerd TikToks. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. I just need to spend more time on it. Um, yeah, so I use Instagram and WhatsApp, but those are totally personal to me. I have a totally different mindset of what I want on Instagram. Like I don't want to hear about someone's paper on Instagram. I want to see pictures of their dog or cat. I want to see pictures of their dinner and I want to see their knitting. I love to knit. Um, I don't want to hear about people's latest results on Twitter. I would love to hear about your latest results. Um, so yeah, I have some different um, expectations based on the platform that I use. Fantastic. And there's a lot um, there to think about. And I have about a million follow up questions, but I would like to move on to our next speaker, John Bohannon. Um, and I have to say, I've, I've been a fan of the dancer PhD um, idea uh, 
forever. And it's such an honor that you've been able to join us with, uh, with Abby and Bamini both. Um, I was wondering if you could dance your introduction, but you, you can talk about it if you insist, so. You're on mute. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anita. Um, nice to meet everyone, uh, especially the ones I can't see. Um, I, yeah, I, my arc uh, was like Abby's. It started with a normal PhD, a normal scientist person, and then careened off into um, weird territory. So my path was um, uh, after my PhD, which was uh, in England at Oxford, in molecular biology, um, I I really didn't want to go right into a lab as a postdoc. I wanted to tr at least take a, a take a breath, and uh, I applied for so many random little you know those little things you do in your career that are like little placeholders, like go do a Fulbright for a year in a country, go do this, go do that. So you know the process for doing that you may remember uh, from you know college days. And grad school days is you write a million letters and applications and they go off like spores in the wind. And the one that landed was at uh, Science, the journal. So I sent a, a letter to the editor of Science saying that I was a PhD uh, molecular biologist um, on also a playwright because I was actually like skiving off from my PhD at least half the time doing stuff on stage and writing uh, for a stage. And uh, my letter circulated as a joke at Science and uh, got passed around and eventually landed on the desk of the news editor who in a previous life, a guy named Ruben Ellenstein, I think is his name, um, he was a novelist. And so he, he wrote me back. He said, well, you have a strange, interesting background. Maybe you should do our um, internship in the news department. And uh, so then my letter got passed to a guy named Rich Stone who, in the brand new Cambridge, England office of science. And lo and behold, he needed an intern, didn't have any, and was not well-known office yet in the UK. And he was like, have you ever written any journalism? And I was like, nope. And he said, okay, well, here's a scientific paper, uh, you know, write about it. And I was like, what format? Can you give me an example of what <laughs> science journalism looks like? And he sent me a few links and I was like, okay, I, I can copy this style. And uh, snuck in under the line, became an intern and then launched a 14 year career as, an, as a science journalist uh, based mostly in Europe. And uh, then along the way, um, I, I was in, living in Vienna and um, I wanted to throw a really good New Year's Eve party at this uh, biomolecular like institute uh, that they had created. L great space, tons of people, um, but I really wanted it to be a dance party. And so to get, the, get all the uh, scientists uh, at the party to dance, I wanted to make it competitive because I, I knew that would, that would work or at least the results would be hilarious. And so we made this content, like the, the idea in a nutshell was you have to uh, explain your PhD research uh, through a short dance. And um, a friend of mine was filming it. And so video of that is now you know on the internet and I put out a little story about it in science. And then the emails start rolling in. When's the next contest? And I was like, oh, I guess there has to be, I guess this has to be a thing. And it's been going ever since. It's been, I don't know, like 13 years. And by now, like the internet owns this. I got to like full disclosure, I barely have to run this thing. Like this is like a filter on the world's internet population that just finds the very unusual people who happen to be in the Venn diagram intersection of doing or have done a PhD in a STEM field, are an exhibitionist, um, totally don't mind making a fool of yourself. And crucially, like you're pretty chill with the idea that the rest of your life, when people Google your name, right on the front page results will be a video of you dancing. That's a pretty small population. Uh, and this contest is like probably the only way imaginable to find those people. And they're all over the world. We, we, we get submissions in from like many, many countries every year, many, many different dance styles. Um, you know, ones you've heard of and ones that I think you would be hard placed to put a name to. Uh, and um, all I have to do is, is basically announce the contest. It happens on YouTube now. They send the links in, sign a form. Uh, I send the links to a panel of judges that I assemble each year, famous scientists, famous dancers. 
famous science communicators, you know, and uh, they score them and then we give out a prize. That's, that's literally it. It's so easy. And, and it, it's like this engine for generating science explainers that are unlike anything you, it's just like a different flavor than anything you would ever get because it's straight from the scientist who went through, you know, the usually hellscape of a PhD. And the last thing they want to do is exp give that PowerPoint demonstration yet again of what their research was about. But they actually turn it into this cathartic, goofy, often very goofy, um, you know, dance number, dance video, with usually made with their friends and family or their lab mate, and or lab mates. And so it's like this little freebie catharsis that people are having, and we all get to share it. So yeah, now by the way, I'm I'm not a journalist at all. For five years, I've been an AI company. I went back to science via data science, and now I lead machine learning research at a San Francisco startup. But I still run this contest. That's my last like strange <laughs> activity. I'm still going strong. Maybe you can have a part two that's dancer AI algorithm or something. <laughs> well, in <laughs> fact, uh, so we start with the prizes now. And uh, this year we have a special prize for machine learning dance. It doesn't even have to be a PhD topic. Any dance about machine learning. Uh, this would be the first time we did that. We did a, one about COVID research last year. So I think this is probably what we'll do going forward is have a special additional prize on some theme that's like relevant for the time uh, each year. So right now it's machine learning. That's fantastic. And for those of you who haven't looked at it, I strongly urge you to look and look up a number of these. I honestly got very addicted. I spent a whole night just, I couldn't stop watching them. And I learned so much about science. It's really an incredibly helpful art form. Um, thank you so much, John. Um, yeah, glad to be here. <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, Bomini, lastly, over to you. Um, and um, incredibly interested also in, in, you were so incredible at knowing what was happening in terms of molecular biology starting during the COVID epidemic. That's, that's how I've grown to admire your social media savvy and usage, but um, would love to hear more. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, pleasure to be on this panel and thanks for the invite. So my name is Bamani Diawal Singham. I started my PhD, uh, I have a PhD in microbiology uh, from a public health school, which means I have that sort of joint interest in molecular biology and public health. And I joined Twitter, that was, that was my first foray into social media for science um, communication in 2013. And I joined really as a, as a consumer, like I wanted to know what was happening. And mostly I was following at this time, public health uh, organizations, CDC, FAC, Public Health Agency of Canada, that is uh, WHO, mostly just to see what their white papers were and what they were coming out with. And because that's, that's the ultimate goal of our research, right? Like I studied a protein that might be a drug target in malaria, but what, where does this go? I, I, I liked, it, it allowed me to bridge that gap between what I was doing in the lab and where, what impact it can have. Uh, as time progressed, 2013 became 2016, 17, 18, Twitter became a more political space in, in at least the my Twitterverse. And I started to use it to under, to follow a lot of journalists because I found a lot of journalists were using it to just like, put down their thoughts about what was happening in America. And there was a very public health lens to this as well in terms of migration and um, increased disease and climate change. And I thought that was interesting because uh, it was a way for me to understand sentiment around issues uh, without, uh, that, that was absent from the, the finished product. Uh, and I find that's true for science as well. Um, people are more willing in a medium like Twitter to put out their ideas uh, because it's not a final form. So then you'll get that commentary as well. And sometimes I, I do like seeing the comments. So after my PhD, I, um, I feel like I went from molecular biology to further and further up. So I did population health research and then I did the AAAS fellowship. Uh, in DC at NIH uh, um, supporting policy 
there was actually a policy to um, increase consideration of sex as a biological variable in research, study, and design. I learned a, a lot about science, scientists' assumptions or, um, or uh, barriers to considering broadening how they, um, how they design research. And, and it, it was interesting to be on the other side, you know, to be in a, in a funding organization that was responsible for implementing policies that, that scientists should follow. Um, so that communication piece of it is, is, uh, was always interesting to me because as scientists, we have to communicate to the public, but the public also should communicate back our needs. And, and I thought NIH has really interesting models for doing that. Um, when you think about how patient care is, or patient needs are integrated into funding portfolios and, and the design of those funding portfolios. This was another place, like Twitter was a place where a patient could communicate with a researcher who was studying something. Um, and so, and then now joining Elsevier, my job is uh, to understand the impact of research and I've gone to, I, I've used social media to see what value or how help clients understand uh, the metrics and what they can interpret from those metrics. So what does it mean, for example, that uh, Abby gets a million likes on her tweet thread or, or John's uh, videos get seen by a lot of people? What does that mean for science? And um, what are the biases inherent in that and how can can we utilize that or improve on that? So that's, that's my job now. Um, so I use mostly Twitter. I, I gravitate towards Twitter because it's a text medium um, and I, I, I go there for the words. So it's, it's, very, um, it's, it's very useful for that. Whereas I find the other mediums, Facebook is a good example. Uh, they, they, it seems to encourage a different kind of dialogue um, and, and yeah, I, and I, I like that Twitter has these communities and as a, as an analyst, I can look at that data to understand what's going on, how to, for example, diversify a community or what, what some of the limitations of communities that are talking about something is and how that might influence the research that comes out of it. Can we ask each other questions now? I think that's a great idea. Yes, I was going to ask if you have questions for each other. Let's start there. That'd be great. So I've got a question for Bamani about alt metrics. Um, I remember, like, uh, not not long after my PhD, alt metrics became a, a phrase, and then it became a company, and it became a thing we, you know, like numbers that we see all over the internet. Um, I stopped paying attention to it um, once I, you know, left academia. So I'm kind of like coming back to it. What happened to alt metrics? Uh, I don't just mean the company, uh, which I guess is still part of Nature Publishing Group or something. I don't, I don't know if it's still web of science or Clarity. Oh, alt metrics is now owned by Clarity. Yeah. Oh, I thought they were started by uh, the Nature Publishing Group. Totally unrelated. Our, our equivalent is called Plum Metrics. Yeah, Elsevier. I thought it was digital science, uh, Mike. Exactly. Uh, and is digital science? Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Too. <laughs> um, what I'm really more interested in is um, like back in the day, it was like, oh, we shouldn't just uh, keep track of citation count. Um, we should keep track of things like news stories about the research and you know, whatever. And, and I knew that grew to social media eventually. Twitter didn't exist when all metrics was born, I think. Um, and uh, where's it come? You know, is it like accepted now pretty much across the board that um, H index is only one of many important things? You know, do tenure decisions actually include mm. alt metric considerations? Like, has the culture changed? How have things evolved? It, so the place where I see the biggest uh, sort of indicator is in the evaluations of those things. So, you know, if, if a faculty position, if they're looking for someone who's going to communicate science, then this will be part of those metrics and it's laid out. But it's not, 
um, ideally, it's not going to be the other way around where you're rewarded or penalized for not doing that. And I think it's really uh, helped hire, hiring um, or, yeah, helped to clarify what the value is, what value they're trying to gain from, from any hire or publication. And I, news is actually a really good example. Um, uh, a lot of clients, academic clients, for example, will come to us and ask us to measure how much they're mentioned in the news. And if they're not mentioned in the news much, they're surprised. But then I ask, do you have a press department? Do you release press, press uh, releases? And if they don't, um, that's, that's probably why, because of that uh, ecosystem of how science becomes news isn't well understood uh, globally even. I think the US academic institutes do this, invest a lot in this actually, and, and other countries academic institutes don't as much. And so, so that's what you're evaluating with the news, right? How good is your press department um, or PR department? It's, it's similar with, with the altmetrics. I like to use altmetrics actually to understand community, um, how communities are developing around, around topics. Uh, if you look at Ebola, for example, there were very tight, um, if, I, if I looked up all the tweets about Ebola papers, there are a couple of small communities. I have also looked up all the tweets uh, early on in the first three months of COVID papers, and there were very uh, huge, there were more communities and they were very large. And so when you drill down on that, you can understand that there's uh, communities, regional differences in communities and sentiment based differences. So certain sentiments were dispersing in different ways. So when I say sentiments, actually, I mean facts, like certain kinds of concepts about where it came, where the virus came from, that kind of thing. So that's, I think that's where the value of altmetrics comes from, more than just counting, counting tweets and lights. Abby, I have the feeling you want to add something here. Yeah, go ahead. I have a follow-up. Have either of you heard of the Kardashian index? Every so often this is thrown around as an altmetric um, that is intended to be, I think, um, insulting, but it's just measuring a different type of thing. This is um, some kind of fraction of your Twitter Twitter followers with your H index, with the number of papers you've been on. Um, the idea being that if you have a high Kardashian index, you are very popular in social media, but perhaps haven't published as much as other people have decided one should. Um, and every so often, some th this kind of comes up as an idea again, and people get insulted, and then other people are very proud of, of their Kardashian index. I think it's fine. Yeah, the K index. Yeah, um, it's just it's another index to measure yet another thing. Um, just because some people are really good at communicating their science, and maybe they're not putting out free papers a year, but the papers they do put out are really great, and that's okay in my opinion. So if I can ask a question, Abby, you mentioned. Um, when you were talking about TikTok, that you felt very, if I can rephrase what you said, algorithmed at, so to speak, like, um, you know, you felt manipulated by the algorithm. Now, of course, there was a huge amount of conversation about, about algorithms and how they can manipulate, um, and in particular, how ever more sort of extreme views are promoted by algorithms, because they do inspire such, you know, activity by the user. It yeah. just figures something... All of you microbiologists can probably, you know, tell me exactly what what neuron is firing when. Or I know you're not neuroscientists, but still, you know, you you can tell what's what um, hormones are being triggered when I see something horrible or something hilarious or something adorable, like somebody I know who knit a hat for their webcam. Just this is spoiler alert. Maybe we will see one later. Ah! There's a hat for your webcam. Anyway, um, but so uh, I, I just want to say, how does that whole sort of excitement and what you're mentioning, Abby, where you're saying, I know my audience, I know exactly how to work with them. It has to do with something like popularity. How does that mesh with the idea of science being about, you know, ground truth, about important stuff, not necessarily only exciting stuff? Can you say a bit about where do you see that that tension resolve? What what do you think of that? Yeah, this I uh, this is getting at something which I I um I don't so so I'm I'm not the most popular scientist on Twitter. Just for everybody to be very clear about this, I have a very small following, a great one, and I I love those people, but like it's small. 
Um, and there is this balance that I find I personally want to strike between the all caps excitement and the things that I find to be genuinely pushing the field forward. Um, and every person has their own balance that they, to, that they choose to strike for their own audience. And, um, and I mean, the, the, yeah, there, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit stumped. Sorry about this. Um, I, I struggle with, I haven't put it in exactly these words, but this is something that I, that I, I think I've thought about quite a bit about, um, popularizing and and hyping things uh versus when when you want to don't want to overhype something so like some things like um the gravitational wave discovery is worth the hype right we've been working towards this for however many decades and when the first thing came and when the first publication came out in 2015 like this was worth the hype um and so multiple all caps twitter threads is like the least you can do um, whereas there's some other things where like a lot of science is incremental and this is a very damaging word to say in academic spheres, but you don't have these giant jumps every time. So often it's just like little steps. Um, and some of those steps are bigger than others. And this is what tends to get hyped as well, but I don't know, somehow hyping every single step just makes me tired. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's certainly a balance to strike between um, promoting the action, the, the things that are truly moving the field forward versus just, um, a lot of all caps. Yeah. As somebody says in the chat failure, there is much more failure than success. Um, for every paper you see, who knows how many null result papers were, were almost going to happen or did happen. So yeah. Um, I think there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of complexity to this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that I give Bomini and John the opportunity to maybe address this point. Um, if algorithms, you know, promote extremism, um, how should we as scientists interact with them? Hmm. I don't know, Bomini, you have a strong opinion? I've got like hmm. weak opinions. <laughs> like as, as someone who's measuring uh, these as metrics where I, what I do is I try and understand what the biases are in, in the system. So um, for example, gender uh, region, certain genders and regions just have stronger likelihood of being liked or retweeted. And knowing that in itself for me helps me be able to explain the value or caveats to those metrics. Um, I don't think I'm, we're going to change that. And as consumers, it's more a thing that like as consumers, when we consume media, we have to be aware of social media, you know, science on social media, we have to be aware of what the incentives are for the creator and what their biases are, are as they communicate them. And as we follow someone a lot, or, or, you know, when I follow my school that I'm an alum from, when I follow their, their feed, I know they're trying to promote their research. And keeping that in mind is very important in how we consume that research or, or that communication. I've designed some of these algorithms myself now over the past five years. Uh, I even like helped build a product that reads scientific papers. Um, and the the most striking thing for me is how differently you design an algorithm when the user is um, and the user's work is the is the driving principle as opposed to, uh, a strange brew of like, I want to advertise, I want to um, bring attention to certain things and not others. You know, I have preconceptions about you, the user. It gets even harder when you have multiple users with very different, uh, you know, goals. So it's very, very hard to design a single algorithm that doesn't have problems that you would be embarrassed about. Um, even, even when your goal is, is like, you know, making a tool that helps uh, researchers 
find relevant research for themselves and you have no ulterior motive, but if, you know, if it was a nonprofit making such tools, um, you still have problems. Uh, you know, one group might be really interested in um, finding the most influential science. And like, okay, well, how do I define influence? And now you're, you know, getting in the weeds. Maybe another one is actually interested in finding science done by diverse people. You know, I want to find, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a someone who wants to find women scientists in a certain field. Maybe they want to, you know, do targeted hiring. That's that's a very great, um, you know, that's a great motivation. How are you going to design that? How are you going to detect women? First of all, I've I've written algorithms that try and do that. It's really hard. You can't just rely on first names. Uh, <laughs> you know, so algorithms are are just a mess and. Um, they're not all evil. They, they're certainly not all designed by people with evil intentions, but even the simplest, best intended algorithms quickly create all kinds of problems. And they're, and they're unless you, you know, have a computer science degree and you're looking at the code yourself, you'll have no idea what the algorithm is actually doing. That's super interesting. And by the way, in the chat are a couple of links by works on gender disparities by both Bomini and John. So that interestingly, you have both done work on this, which is kind of fascinating. Um, I wanted to I'll turn to- add to this, um, an opportunity, John, John mentioning algorithms, remind me that we also tend to get in a loop of how we consume things and what we keep going for but maybe the opportunity for algorithms is to show us what our behavior is and, and surface the opposite of that. So, uh, and right now, most algorithms for social media try and get us more of what we already are asking for. And what if it did the opposite of that? So, you know, you've been reading a lot of uh, research from Ivy League schools. Have you looked at X from, this, from uh, the other side of the planet? Um, I've been I wanting think... to build that for a while, actually. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I call it the um, reading diet. So essentially you'd get a nutrition report at the end of every day or week, or whatever, <laughs> whatever you want. And it would really do exactly what you're saying, Bamani. It would just say, well, here's what you're eating. You need um, to read more stuff from public universities. Right on. And wouldn't it be great if you could actually feed that desire into an algorithm, which is just running off and trying to satisfy that part of your diet. No one's made such a thing yet. You That's super interesting. We're doing a, a couple of things also for reviewer recommender systems for editorial systems. But um, I want to get this is a fantastic conversation and I would love to keep going down this street. But I do want to allow some time for the questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, I wanted to ask a question. The description for the panel discussion mentions, mentions WhatsApp. Have any of you used it and why? Um, I just wanted to add the Sapta did mention using WhatsApp. And one thing that I wanted to ask in particular, um, my colleague who's Haitian Creole says that um, in her community and her parents' community, all news comes in through WhatsApp. Um, and yet I know very few people who use it for anything else except, you know, I'm at the bar, you know, meet you in 10 minutes kind of a thing. So love to have your take on that. Um, I don't know if any of you have experience with WhatsApp or, or use it at all for scientific uh, communication. Or not, in which case. Nope. I, my experience, I yeah, my experience with WhatsApp has been four words uh, from my South Asian mother and mother-in-law uh, often. So then my role there is um, correction of science <laughs> that's been communicated from a, from a uh, questionable source. Um, my take on it is that it seems to be similar in, to Facebook in content. Uh, I like that there is now a forwarded many times and forwarded many, many times uh, label on some of the forwards. That actually is a nice indicator for me to, to you know, point out to recipients or who are forwarding it to me. Uh, I also like it because it has, well, in my, uh, my graduate school community, Kind of gathered back together as a result of COVID because we're all molecular biologists in immunology and microbiology to just discuss um, in, a, in a close setting some of the news that's happening, uh, 
what our take on it is. Um, I'm very lucky in that one of those people is currently at Moderna and one of them uh, used to run Anthony Fauci's lab. So there's a, a, a couple are at the CDC, you know, so there's like really interesting perspectives there. Um, so I, I value it for that purpose, almost like an international version of SMS. Thanks so yeah. much. For sure. I also, I use WhatsApp and I use Signal quite a bit more lately as international group chat um, that everybody can see in the same way. Uh, Cause also as academics, we, we move around so much and we have people from, we, we have people in our social groups from so many different countries who maybe live in a different country to us that it's really helpful to have that. Um, I, I like that they're now telling you when things get really forwarded because it's like in the early days of email when you would get the forwarded chain from a family member and it had re forward 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 like many times you knew that you could just delete it right away and everything was fine. Um, <laughs> but good on you for trying to combat uh, misinformation with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another question from the from the audience that I wanted to address is, do you actively work to grow your social media followers um, or has it grown without your input? Um, uh, love to love to hear again, actually, maybe Abby, but but also John um, thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I have not tried whatsoever. Um, I find that when I start trying too much for it, it loses the fun like really fast. Like to me, the point of being a public scientist on social media is to show that it's fun and to like to have fun with it. Like this is not a paid part of my job. And so I, if, if I'm going to be doing work related things on my own time, I should only be doing them because I actually enjoy them and turning it into a job makes it not fun for me. So I, I intentionally, I don't intentionally do anything to grow my followers. I just say a bunch of stuff and People like it, it seems, um, but yeah, that's it. I, I tell my students about the YouTube videos, but that's because I made the videos for the students. So they aren't following me by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, ditto. Un unmuted, so go ahead. Yeah, ditto. I, um, I, I stayed off Twitter. I like joined Twitter right the really early on and then like stayed the hell off it because it just looked like such a distraction and, like low value place. And the only thing that brought me back to it was now that I need to hire people and I need to be a part of an academic community, which is, you know, I haven't it's been since my PhD days, but then I had to actually be part of an academic community, but now I am. And so, you know, there are machine learning researchers out there that I need to listen to and, you know, send compliments to. I love sending compliments to grad students. That's my favorite activity on Twitter. They publish a paper, and you know, did a really good job, and I just love showing them with attention. That's my favorite thing. Otherwise, I hate Twitter. Um, I think it's a uh, arena of cruelty. Um, I do like occasionally doing stunts on Twitter. Like if I make a an AI, uh, you know, toy that does something really amusing, sometimes I'll unleash it on Twitter. Not as a bot. I'll make it very clear. I'll signal that I'm doing this little experiment. For example, I did one where. I wrote, um, I, I, made, I made a model that could predict your age based on your tweets. And it was like 90% confidence within 10 years. I so, remember yeah. this. Yeah. And that was you? Yeah, so that was really <laughs> fun. That's like a stunt. It's like a really fun stunt. I also made one that would write your biography, uh, your Twitter profile based on your tweets. And so like the best one was I did it on Elon Musk and it was something like, I'm just a guy who likes cars, space, and Elon Musk. <laughs> Thumbs it up, I would say. He looked like <laughs> one of his own fans, essentially, to the model. Um, I, I trained it on you know, a huge number of actual Twitter profiles, so it just learned to do what the data says. So I like doing that on Twitter, but even that doesn't generate a lot of following unless you do that like a job. I, I see people on Twitter who have day jobs and they're like tweeting every like 20 minutes, certainly every hour during work hours. I'm just not going to do that. I'm convinced they're using a reposting app that like that they, 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 they that they schedule everything. I'm convinced they have to be doing so that. Cause otherwise how, you don't have any time for deep thought in your job, like yeah. to do your job. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah. You just write, write the Should week's utterances 
and uh, and then it gets doled out. The problem is um, uh, they're they're be, they're really reacting in real time, replying to things, and I, it's not that's not what the ones I have in mind. That's not what they're doing. They're just like out there working on social media like slave labor. It's not going to do it. I think the other part of that, and I definitely observe this during the pandemic is that they are becoming uh, resources for news. So that has been a major aspect, at least for the microbiology and public health spheres that I follow. Uh, as soon as you become the person who's often quoted, there was someone I used to follow who was an epidemiologist, uh, I still follow, and she used to have like a, a candy war every year. And it was like, what's your favorite candy? And that was, and she had not that many followers. And then she uh, became often quoted in certain news media outlets and really exploded. And there's no more candy war. Um, but that that is a place. And we see that uh, connection as well, that the loudest voices in cer certain science fairs on Twitter, you also, and the most tweeted papers are also people who are, um, who are quoted in the news, who, who journalists go to for quotes. So there is that confluence that uh, perpetuates or can perpetuate bias. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to um, ask for one more question from the audience, which I, I think is a fascinating question and apologize to the other audience members whose questions we're not gonna get to because I think this is the last audience question. Um, and I wish, I hope we can keep this conversation going. There was a question if you guys would be willing to share your handles. So maybe people can just tweet at you at the very least, if not your TikTok handles. Um, I really like this question from Mike M, a, AKA the research rabbit. When it comes to creating content, how do you balance the different elements of your identity? I'm a space explorer. I'm an international scholar. I'm not sure what an ECR is, but um, uh, I've always thought it would be interesting to have like a predicate cloud sort of hanging over you, you know, when you're when you're like at a conference and you do an augmented reality thing. Maybe, John, you can build this that you can see. Yes. Also, I like cats. Also, I knit little hats for my um, that's just my favorite example for my for my camera. Um, also, I, I am interested in black holes. So so but these different aspects of your identity, I think, Abby, you certainly alluded to it that you use different platforms. And in fact, you feel a little it feels a little uncomfortable, like your parents coming to your party if, you know, somebody shows up at the wrong platform kind of a thing. So any thoughts on how you distinguish that? Thanks. Somebody else want to start? I think compartmentalization is, is probably, I mean, that's what Abby described as well. Um, it, it's one way, I mean, if we're talking about intersectionality, like let's think of our Netflix profile, like it, to some extent, it's finally figured out. I like uh, documentaries with the, you know, this kind of blah, blah, blah. Like it, they, they've become so finite in, or so uh, granular in their recommendations. Uh, I kind of try and achieve that in my social media and, and either have different accounts. Uh, it helps my brain in some ways because I'm compartmentalizing my, my personas. I don't follow any parenting stuff on Twitter because that's not where I go for it, that kind of thing. Uh, it's more self-care than anything else. That's how I see it, that compartmentalization, but I don't think it's a necessity. Yeah, I do something similar. Um, my Twitter is a lot of it's a lot of science stuff and a lot of just general academic stuff. Um, as I said, I really love the the community of other academics in totally different fields who I've connected with on there. Um, I also really love following um, like filmmakers and um, directors and writers. I follow a bunch of writers, um, and I it's kind of like nurturing that creative side. Like that's what I want Twitter to do. Whereas Instagram is just like my feel good like. I want cute dogs and I want nice houses with clean rooms and I want knitting and like maybe some food. Like that's what I want on Instagram. So I do compartmentalize as well, but like in terms of my identities on Twitter, I only have the one Twitter account. Um, and so um, as Mike had said, with all these different 
um, identities. I like part of why I have my Twitter account as my, my name is my handle. And it's not like Astro Abbey or science Abbey or something is because it's not just the science that I'm talking about. I also tweet a lot about politics. I like, I am an early career researcher. I am a woman in science. I'm a very feminine woman at that. Um, I'm bisexual. I have lived internationally. Um, I have a dog. Like there's all of these things about me. I'm an astronomer. Like there's all of these things about me that all feed into who I am as a person and how I interact with science and how I interact with the community. And I don't, I don't know if I emphasize any of those more than others, but I don't try to hide any of it in terms of my professional identities and the personal identities that feed into my professional identity. John, I just uh, add. I yeah, I only have the one identity, but I just uh, try and keep it really scoped down because uh, there's just a lot of conversations that aren't well suited to Twitter, um, like you know nuanced conversations. It's just really not the medium for that, and I care about a lot of things that require nuanced conversations. The only thing you know, there's a few things that don't require nuance, like complimenting a grad student on a great paper. That's like, that's a single tweet situation. I can handle that. But like if things veer into politics or, you know, even, even like controversies within science, um, it's very hard to um, make your points with intellectual honesty without getting mired in this back and forth where, at, at, you know, this lossy, lossy, um, chain of exchanges where eventually you're not even talking to each other. I, I just like, don't want to even get into it. I just find it not the place for me to talk about things that I really care about a lot that have any nuance. So I think on that note, um, we're at the top of the hour and I, I just want to say, I so thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, and I think there was a lot of nuance. There's so much here that I would love to hear more about. I'm frankly thinking we should have a whole whole workshop devoted to this topic. Um, really, really grateful for, for all our speakers. I want to give you one last chance to uh, maybe say something you haven't been able to say, but otherwise, just thank you for participating. Abby, any parting thoughts? Um, yeah, I, um, somebody mentioned some of the audio spaces that are happening, and um, I really like that this is perhaps a space for more long form um, connections and conversations. Um, I don't always have the attention span for it, but um, uh, overall, like, I am really glad that we have social media, even though on the, any given day, I usually don't like it. Um, I think it adds a really nice aspect to the science research um, the uh, av arena. There we go. And um, and my uh, my experience as a professional researcher and um, instructor. I just I I do I do ultimately really like it, even if I complain a lot on a given day. That's great, John. Any parting wisdom from you? No, no. Just uh, I enjoyed this so much. It's it's yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just like. A business guy now. I miss talking to people across fields uh, about science. It's a delight. Well, we'll gladly have you back. Bamini, you get the very last word. Sure. So um, I would like to just bring up one more thing, which is social media is one place where scientists, we can really get in a bubble in our, like, in our labs. Uh, and social media is a place where we can easily learn what other people are thinking about um, about a thing. Like John said, it's a, it's a terrible place, Twitter, but you can see what people might be thinking or how they might respond to something. And I like that about it because otherwise I wouldn't know. And go going into the comments uh, helps me understand how people think and how we might improve our communication or anticipate you know, how, how better, how to better communicate about science. So just adding to what John said here. That's really great. And, and thank you all also for sharing your handles. I think this conversation can continue because we can all meet on the various social media. Um, so with that, another th huge thank you. Um, wish we could all, you know, adjourn have a drink, have a cup of coffee and continue the conversation. But thank you all very much for participating.
Um, Racha, any last words from you? No, I just thank, thank all the speakers and everyone who has participated through the chat. As, uh, and it says we could go on for several hours, but there is another session coming up at FORCE 2021. So hopefully catch you at another session. Thank you for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.